Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind-the-scenes tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your hosts, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Mr. Al Gore, how's it going? It is fantastic. It's going great. Good. Another sunny day. Yeah. Uh, huge first shout out to uh, Chad Harris. Thank you, Chad Harris. Uh, you made. I was already having a good day yesterday, but I I had an even better day after after I checked the mail because um we got some fan mail. It's incredible. Some listener mail. Yeah. I feel like a celebrity. You you are. It's super cool. Seriously, I thought that I thought it was the coolest thing. So what? So Chad sent each Alex and I a book, and it's called it's. So it's a he's published the book actually. It's a journal, not a book. Okay, sorry, I just because I don't want people to get the wrong impression. <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to explain what it is perfectly. You're right, Al. It is not. It is not a book. It is a uh, journal. So it's called the Everyday Architect, a daily guided journal and sketchbook for architects. Uh, so Chad sent us a uh, handwritten note. Handwritten note. He must be listening to Entree Architect. He must be listening to Entree Architect. Yep, absolutely. Uh, the podcast that I keep talking about, uh, this specific episode actually. And uh, the, the little note was it was great. And so he said, uh, so I went and looked this up on um, Amazon. We will link to it. Um, so you can pre-order because it's going to be released on November 19th, uh, 2018, this year. So Al will put a link in uh, the show notes for it. You can pre-order it, um, and then uh, and then obviously and then Chad said, "Hey, uh, he told me in my little postcard, if you are going to review it, go ahead and add five stars on top. I'm going to do that. <laughs> Look at that. I'm going to do that. And you know what? I'm going to review it on Amazon. You need to too once it once we can. Yep. If, if it's that way too. He he wrote uh, so a, a note, but the little P.S. was you got me straight on addicted to jackal podcast as you should Al. very very as proud of that should. so if you haven't listened to jackal podcast go ahead and start at episode one start episode one go all the way through yep. you yep. will not be disappointed so uh, so i'm just gonna read a paragraph out of the it's a little preface here <clears throat> and uh so the the everyday architect journal is designed designed to help you grow by dedicating a few minutes each day to a journaling at practice studies have shown that by keeping a daily journal you can reduce stress Better clarify your thoughts and feelings, solve problems more effectively, and even improve your mental health, your physical health. With daily prompts and exercises, this journal is designed to help you improve your productivity, focus on your important goals, grow your creativity muscle, and increase your happiness on a daily basis. So I am pumped up to start this. It's really cool. Um, there is, um, so basically it's like a journal, and there's all kinds of goals they have set up for you and everything like that. I'm actually going to do it starting in the new year that's going to be this is going to be my new year's resolution nice so chad nice. look at you influencing me yep after i after we're influencing you thanks so much for sending it when i first got it i so i already have a planner and i thought oh is this gonna do i have to wait for my planner to be done to start this and no because this is this is actually totally different so my planner i have with me all the time yep a little I, black book al's got it's a little lines in it al's writing stuff down i i see him doing it yep and my planner gets so full of my tasks that i can't even write notes in it so now i have a little notebook for when i'm taking notes i'm trying to take better notes rich branson takes notes he's worth billion dollars billion billion literally in and in, <laughs> in class yesterday and alex was lecturing he's like hey richard branson takes notes guys why aren't you taking notes he's a billionaire yeah <laughs> yeah but so how I'm going to use this, and I think how it is supposed to be used is I'm going to put it in my kitchen. So every night I grab coffee and every, no, sorry, every morning oh I grab coffee. God. Every night I make my coffee because I like iced coffee. So I put it in yeah, the He's fridge. a vampire. Remember, he's right? a vampire. So this has basically every week you start out and you fill out, you know, what your goals are. It has a weekly challenge for you, right? And then it has a daily sketch. So in the morning I can do a daily sketch. So it's like journaling only for architects architects and it's it, it's kind of a planner but not really don't think about this replacing your planner and then it has you know daily things you can do and every day it has an architectural quote on it so i'm like this is so perfect for us and i I'll, think it's cool i think it's such a cool uh so it looks like it's gonna sell for again alex we'll put a million, link up million for, for 29 dollars 
Um, great price, and uh, so it's a hard cover. Obviously, you know he's not going to do an audio because you got to you got to do it. Yeah, but it's cool. I'm excited to do this. Yeah. So, non architect people, if you have an architect friend, get it for him. Yeah, this would be cool. what a great stock stocking stuffer. But bosses, get it for your employees. Yes, get it for your all. Okay, we hint, need to do that. Hint, now. hint. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to order like six of them. Uh, <laughs> the, so I'll read one of the quotes. Uh, I don't. This is from Bjark Ingels, big architects. You guys should know about greatest, him. greatest. I don't have to come up with the best ideas. It's my job to make sure that it oh, that it is always the best ideas that win. I've been feeling like that for a long, long time, and that put it in perfectly. Yep. So get it. Uh, th- yeah, awesome. Yeah, I thank like you it. again, Chad. Seriously, I don't, I, I don't even know you. Re- if you realize, like, that made me feel super special. I feel. Like I was like, wow, this is incredible. This is amazing. And this, you know, it's not not the first time people have sent us stuff. So please continue to send me free things. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, me too. I'm, uh, I also exist. I, I, I hope there's some listeners of firms because I would love this as an employee. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Yeah, even the even the cover and everything feels it feels good. Yeah. Awesome. So, rock so, and roll. I have some questions for you. Oh, oh so business. now it's now it's Lance or sorry, Al questions Lance? All the time. Wow. Um, scary. Okay. So Lance, let's say you're talking to multifamily developer. And and any sort of it could it could be a new commercial project. Okay. But what I'm talking about is a professional who develops properties. He's a seasoned professional, yeah? Seasoned. He's been okay. in for a couple of years, been doing projects like mm-hmm, this. Mm-hmm. And he says, Okay, cut um Cut CA out. We'll deal with that when it when it comes. Um, and of course, you'll handle you know anything that you missed on on, on the drawings. How do you respond to that? What, what what's your? I just said that I'm the developer. I'm saying that to you. Can you repeat that question, yeah. Mr. Developer? So, <clears throat> okay. Hey, I, I love your contract. Looks great. Uh, you have like making up a number fifteen thousand dollars for a construction admin phase. Let's just cut that out. Once it comes, we'll you know go hourly or something we'll figure it out later and but you know if there's any errors on the drawings i want you to change those on on your own dime interesting well i would say that the our common practice here at f9 is we're gonna if there's errors on our drawings it's on our dime and i don't think that ever changes uh i'm a little concerned about us cutting ca out because first of all mr developer i just refresh my memory did you ask for this in the proposal original proposal uh, yes or no, it doesn't matter. I just don't want it right now. You don't want it right now because it was a fixed lump? Yeah. Is that your hang up with this? Yeah. Okay. So you want to do it hourly afterwards? Yeah. Okay, great. Can we put in a clause? In, can, we, can I, what do you think about me adding a clause in the, in the contract that says all construction administration will be performed on an hourly basis past permit submittal yep. or past permit approval? Yep. Well, how do you feel about that? Oh, I feel like that's fine. Okay, I'm cool with that. Okay, here's where Did I'm I getting at. Did I give you the wrong answer? <laughs> I think. Well, I, this is. I literally want to talk about this. Okay. Okay. So, here here's where my head is, and this isn't what I'd say to them, but I'll tell you what I'll, I'll say to you. Um, construction admin, especially for these big projects, is absolutely vital. It's almost saying like going from schematic design to CDs, and you're going to miss out on design development. There's no way drawings can be 100%. So when you say, you know, oh, they're missing or my errors, that's really interpretation. And the reason I know that is because there's going to be work in in CA and there's going to be clarifications. And I know this is a fact because when NASA does spaceships, they're the smartest people on the planet and they have CA. There was a story that I just heard. So they had to put in a new bolt for whatever reason while they were building it. They go, the bolt costs 50 cents. Costs 50 bucks to get an expect the inspector to come look at it. Then it costs 500 bucks to get it on the drawings because they need to come measure and all that, you know, all that stuff. So it was just a, a story about how this works. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm not, to, this is, this is what I want to kind of get across to the, the developer is if we do our own review to do our own really good drawings and we've been doing this for a while, you as a developer will be reviewing it. And we recommend, do you have a contractor on board? That would be my f- main thing. We want him to review it while, while he's going along. The city will also review it. So when we get into CA phase, if something needs to change or, you know, if it's a massive mistake where we miss something, 
you know, hey, we're, we're happy, right? To, we missed to, a beam. To, we missed a beam or something like that. But if somehow we miss something, the contractor missed something and the developer missed something, means you guys bid it out. It went down to subs and you got bids back and either they didn't alert you that something's missing or you didn't know something was missing or you looked over and you missed it and the building official missed it. It's probably one of those cases just like NASA where you can never have drawings 100% done and you just need to deal with it. Because I'm sick of arguing with, oh, who, you know, whose fault was that? I, I drew the, so for example, project, I drew it two years ago. You guys looked at it. You had a developer look at it. You had a contractor look at it. The city looked at it. You want to now do it a different way. You know, like that's great. You got to pay for it. It's going to cost you. I'm not going to do it for free. It's going to cost you. So I don't know how to say that like in a non-combative tone and, and say like, it's a vital phase. And this going back of, you know, oh, you, you missed it. Yeah. Maybe you missed it too. You missed it. The contractor missed it. Yeah. I still think, so let's say, let's say, I don't want to say you cave, but let's say you cater to his request, his or her request. And you say, uh, yeah, sure. What well, we could take out the fee, but I need a clause in there. And so I'm going back to this clause. Is there anything you can add to the clause that says that's, that is, is getting at what you're getting at yep. in, in, in some sort of way and protects, protects where it's just like, yeah, this is uh, fine. We will take that out. But here's, yeah. here's, here's what will constitute extra services. Boom. And you define what will constitute extra services. I, I, so I want to include in there, and I think this is where you can say, like, here's an example. Boom. A change of systems, meaning you have a ceiling system. We draw it. You looked at it. You reviewed it. You approved it. The city approved it. If you want to change a system during construction, because right now the argument is, oh, this is more, you know, like you didn't do the system right. This is a you know, better, cheaper system. This is your fault. Now in the new going forward, no, you change, you change the system. There might be an, an improved system, but it's not like we all didn't see what system was there. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Uh, but so I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Yeah, how, but please do. How, 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 you know, like I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate. I'm, I'm still on the fence about like, should you go to a clause? Should you, uh, should you cater to their request, go to a clause yeah. or should you hold your ground? Like kind of, I kind of like I did yesterday with that other contract I told you about. Yeah. And should you say something like I've been saying with custom clients where they try to, they try to reduce our fees or something. Not everybody does, but some people do. And then I then I say, Hey, um, the fee I've given you means that typically we are not asking for extra money and I don't want to set up the whole contract in such that we are looking at every, um, every step of the way where it's a contentious fight for getting this thing built properly. Yep. Uh, at the end of the day, we want to look forward to your project and this, this fee allows us to look forward and be expeditious with all of changes. Like something like that. You something know what like I'm saying? That. And then how one of our engineers handles and, and, it. And I've kind of convinced myself to go back on that side of the fence. Yeah. Like, you know, the, the more we do this, it's like, it's just clarifying that for everybody. Like this fee allows us to be a priority client. You know, th- things are going to be done thoroughly. We're going to give you quality services. Yep. If you're going to, if you're going to reduce the fee, then the quality of services goes down. That's just the way it is. Yeah. And so, um, Let's say it was an hourly or something like that, or you get to that phase. I would then advise the client, say, because this is how the structural engineer said it to me. How many times do you want me on site? It's 250 per time. Put that in your budget. So once you get to that, say, okay, um, it, it, it's inevitable that I'm going to come on site and it's inevitable that I'm going to have changes. How many do you think that is? It's going to be this many per site, this many per change. You should put that in your budget. So that all of these don't look like, so these are accounted for because it, it, it's a phase that needs to be accounted for. So that's, that's how I would say it is like, you, you can't convince me that you're not going to call me, that I'm not going to come out on site or anything like that. So then I think maybe we could handle that. Oh, if you hear that, it means it's push up time. Mm-hmm. Um, you could handle that by basically saying in your fee, in the original, is like, hey, you have a site visit fee and, and you have, you know, like change fee or, or something like that. Um, and they don't have to pull it because where the nuance is, is sometimes for house clients, 
literally like they pull the permit. They don't even tell me. I don't even know the building's going up and it's done. Like that's how it happened multiple, multiple times. Other house ones, it's like getting a call about this, about this. We do the same standard, the same drawing. So, you know, it's weird to tell that client, that house client, like, we don't know. We've had 50 houses where I've gotten no phone call. We've had 10 houses where it seems like every other week they're asking us a question. But this sounds, yeah, right. But, well, you tried to keep it generic, but then you didn't. And here's what I'm getting at. It's like multifamily developer. Yeah, that's a complicated project. There's nothing simple about a multifamily project. I don't care yeah. how, even our project, it's just yeah. not simple. It's difficult. Yeah. Nuances. A lot of little nuances that need to be clarified. Yeah. So, well, good luck with that, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was my scenario. Now, now I just had, so last week I was telling people about books to listen to. Yeah. What? I thought there was another scenario. Am I missing it? Home cut line. Custom home Oh, line. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, this is lessons from Richard Branson's book, The, the Virgin Way. And I, I just love this quote that he said, this is from Lao Tzu. Leadership is the ability to hide your panic from others. And then he, he goes, I would change it. Leadership is the ability to hide your panic from your banker. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's true so and, and um so we're doing a development and we're doing it because we want to increase our responsibility increase our ward increase what we know about too but the way he put it is because he owns an airline richard branson be a customer of your own product yep and that's a concise way of saying what we're doing so now when we're doing the drawings and when we're going to the banker we understand what the developer is going through and our clients are because we're a customer of our own product. Right. And then when we're building it, we'll look at the drawings and be like, man, I can see how technically it's there, but it's confusing, you know? So maybe we, we tighten up our drawings or make things extra clear or, or something like that. Because maybe we keep seeing the same mistake over and over again. And we go like one of our projects, you should know how to do this. This should be your job, but maybe the labor pool doesn't. So it's like, well, right. who's going to take responsibility for that? Yep. Are we going to consistently st- stub our foot by saying you should know this or should we just draw it differently or better? You know? Um, so get that book. Thought it was cool lessons. I thought it applied. Lessons to- from Richard Branson, the virgin way. Directly Fantastic. to what we are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, we've got some, we've got some uh, listener questions. So now it's going to be Lance questions Al sort of in that way. Uh, brand new segment we're coming up with. So our good friend, Mark R. LePage, wrote us uh, about nine days ago, and he introduced us to a gentleman named Henry Dominguez. Uh, he, he said he's a young architect who is interested in development of real estate investment. Uh, he's starting an online platform named Invest by Design. So I checked it out, and Henry got in touch with us, and <clears throat> he's got some questions for us. So we're going to answer those on air and do double time here because uh, I think he's going to put together a blog post um, on his website about uh, when, at, as it pertains to our questions. So, so Henry's got to listen to this episode. Um, so I'll start off. Here we go. So the gap, the gap between academia and the profession. This is the sort of get your mind there, Al. Okay, you, you're in both. Yeah, okay? you're in both, and there's a gap, and we think we fill it right. Number one, academia creates the space for exploration, research, and failure. Practice values performance and efficiency. Is there a good reason for the gap between academia and practice? Is there a good reason? Are you going to, this is a question, are you going to get the design experience if you have to conform to reality in academia? Right. Um, Man, it seems like the more we grow the more we want to push down what we what we do at the firm into academia and i think that that still holds true i think that and i think it can accomplish in the same time here's an example um lectures so at ndsu we had four lectures each semester from you know they'd fly people in you know like famous Gu- guest people. lectures yep. yeah 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 a- everyone has it right and the typical guest lecture, tell me if I'm wrong, but it was, hey, I'm Zaha Hadid. Here are some of my projects. You know, here's some story behind each project. And there you go. Is that essentially right? Yep. So um, very interesting. You get to see their work and then maybe some one inside story, right? Maybe. And then you can ask a question. So what if you took a different approach and you said, hey, guest lectures, we want you to lecture on one project and please bring either like your engineer or your civil or something like that. 
and go over that one project from where it started, what design decisions made you change the design, what problems did you have, and then how did you overcome them with solutions, and then the end result, right? So it's still an interesting lecture. It's a harder lecture maybe, maybe to do. Um, takes more time to prepare, but it might be more valuable. Right. I think that's a great example of how you could bridge the gap and fuse the two together. Um, because it could still be a crazy Zaha Hadid building. Yeah. It's not like they don't have problems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but then to answer, to answer the question, is there a good reason for the gap between academia, academia and practice? And, and, and I think the key part here is what he, what Henry said is academia creates the space for exp- exploration of research and failure. Uh, I would agree. I, I think, I think the failure part is the, is the, well, exploration and failure. I mean, all of it, all of, all of the above, right? Like you have a, a crazy amount of time, but the problem with that is, is you have too much time. So I think then when you get into practice, all of a sudden there's a timer and you're like, ah, now I'm on the timer. Now I got to, now I got to move as quickly as possible. So how how do I how do I how do I get to an efficiency part, right? I and also um, I don't think there's a good reason for the gap, and here's okay. why: because we we proved it in in studio, in in our classes, where um, a lot of schools think, hey, we need to teach hand sketching first, which is fine, but like a whole semester, you need to produce everything for a whole semester in hand sketching. Then maybe SketchUp. Then maybe computers like third year. And we did it where, hey, we do hand sketching. And then for concepts, you do hand sketching. And then we get into Revit right away. And we get into Revit in not the traditional way, like we give them our firm resources and and all that so that they can really level up and go quickly. But some of the most creative designs, you know, I've not seen a lack in creative designs if you can teach them how to use the tool properly. Agreed. So you're... They say, well, with free hand sketching, you can come up with crazy designs. Yeah, you can. Just the way it's set up now is that you stop a lot of sketching after the second year because you need to get in the computer so much. Why not piece it out so that, okay, you sketch in the beginning and then you're instantly in the computer. And then your second year, you're still sketching and you're in the computer. The third year, maybe you're sketching details, but you're in the computer. You just need to integrate them more. It it doesn't need to be so pieced out and i think that's a problem um it's a problem with too much administration because it's easier to look at it that way. right so so exactly so so why exactly and this isn't even this is a kind of a rhetorical question why can't there be this interjection of reality it's harder into it is harder exactly it's harder it was a rhetorical question though <laughs> yeah. it is harder um why can't you interject that reality into this sort of safe space you know like and i mean that word in the best way like that it's you're it's okay to fail right it's okay to fail with like some crazy blobby design that you come up with but then why like why is it so much to ask to try to make it a reality at the maybe at the end of the studio right we're like no show me how this would work do a detail you know i think that's what ndsu did really well is that when you especially when you got to uh your fifth year and you did the if you took Mark Barnhouse's studio and you had to do a hopefully you did a, an interesting crazy design you know something that's out there yeah. and, and you were forced to figure out where the mechanical goes how the structure works and do some details and explore those things. Well, I think you also do have to do the hard thing too. And I I actually feel like a lot of schools are are pretty decent. So it, this is not just ragging on, on schools, um, but Montana and, State we were impressed. Those sections, those building sections. Kansas State. Yep, Kansas um, State. So there, there's there's a lot of good examples, Cincinnati, stuff like that. Um, but here's maybe where it's coming from. So if you're integrating, it's hard. And if you have students that are draining you of your resources because they're either not caring or they're not up to it, it can fo- not force you but encourage you to maybe simplify, right? You got to kick those students out. You got to, you got to have some sort of academic, you know, like NDSU went from 350 to 50 after the first year. That was at 350 to 50. So you better be good or else don't get in here. And if you don't, this is what I was trying to get at last time. You know, the art versus architecture, like have enough respect for yourself and your profession to put yourself on a high standard saying like what I'm doing is the top stuff. And I don't mean it has to look like Zaha Hadid. I mean, you are balancing multiple multiple forces and you're doing a, a 
you know, you need to do a good job at it. And that is, you know, as good as any other job out there. Yeah. Okay. Second question. What skills do you wish you learned as an architecture student that would give you an advantage today? Were these skills not offered in school? Did you avoid them? Or did you simply not have the awareness for it? Code book. Did they even open a code book in school? Oh, the only thing we ever, I really, I distinctly remember going over was ADA. You know, you got to yeah. make sure you get the accessible sex, accessibility to work. And I want to ask other people, like, did you have, listeners, did you have a course where they made you buy the code book? They explained what it was. You did maybe an example project and you say, okay, what type of construction is this? Yeah. Yeah, what exactly. What occupancy What is, is the this? occupancy? What is the load? How big, how big can you, uh, so like, uh, let's say you're doing an education facility how what how does that and it has to be this big okay then what does that leave you for construction type yep. you know wood frame versus steel versus a combination yeah all of that and it, it this is why it's hard you know okay here's your site too then do you integrate and maybe you do what are your setbacks there's also a thing municipal codes so you got to look at that too like it can get crazy but especially the the code book i i, I just it just baffles me that that relegates and informs so much of what we do. And it was barely talked about. Barely talked about. Yeah. So did you, it was just not offered. That's, I think that's how we'd answer that. Yeah. Number three, looking back, what would you do differently while interning and working for other firms? What did you wish you were taught or made of, made aware of? When I was interning at uh, Leapskin, we were doing the same thing at school. It's crazy. Didn't look at a code book, designing forms, doing crazy Literally stuff. giant skyscrapers. Giant skyscrapers, giant cities, all that stuff. So I don't know. It was it was like school to me. Um, so if I would have started looking at codes and stuff, I don't even know if I had time. But they'd be like, what are you doing? We got older people to do that. Yep. Okay. Number four, what uh, do you recommend young arch- that Do you recommend young architects that plan to start their own firm in the future working for small firms, large firms, or is it important to have a combination of both? Mm. We've only worked... How big was Leapskin when you were there? 50 people? 60. That's big. 60. That's big. Um, Here, you can... You have worked in the gamut though, right? I mean, you've done... I've worked at an engineering firm. That was smaller, like 12 people, right? 12 or less? They were big. They were like 200. Oh, okay. So 260 and then by myself and then this firm. Yep. Um, so I guess you do have sort of, you could sort of give that perspective all the way through. Yep. And, and here, here's what I'll get at. There's an easy way and a hard way. And sometimes the easy way isn't the right way, but sometimes, so here's an example. Let's say you want to do, um, mixed juice buildings. You think they're the coolest thing in the world, right? The easy way is go work for a firm that does a lot of mixed use buildings. I don't even care about the size. I don't even know if the size matters, right? So then if you do want to start out on your on your own, you can say, hey, I've worked on eight mixed-use projects. I know what I'm doing. It's easy people to hire you, right? You can go our way where, okay, we did a bunch of different stuff, but it was all interning, and we started literally from the ground up. And I think it's harder. It's additions, uh, single-family, custom, multifamily, you know, like we're taking a step up each time and then having to convince people like, oh, we can take we that, can do it. Yep. that step up. I like the challenge. I think that's the harder way. I don't even know if it's the smarter way. I don't even think it's the smarter way. I just think it's a different way. So I don't have, I don't think it should be in your mind that, hey, I'm going to go work for the small firm. Then I'm going to jump ship and go work for a big firm. I don't think that matters. I think wherever you're at, I don't think there's, a path that says that's that's the right way to do because you can find examples from everyone from norman foster to whatever where oh they started right out of school bjark ingles he didn't go from a big firm to a medium firm to a small firm that's it's a nice way to categorize and you know administry think about it but it really comes down to who you are and if you're getting the most out of it so i would not think like that whatsoever if you if you don't know this Al Gore shares the same name as a very famous politician. I felt like it was a very politi- very politician like answer. No, Not I'm answer. telling people everyone <laughs> I think everyone says, Yeah, yeah. Try out a big firm, a small firm, see where you fit. Nope. What if you only want to go big firms? 
go ahead. What if you only want to go small firms and you like the vibe? So you're going to ditch out. Let's say you love big firms and you love the, the culture and all that. You're going to ditch out, go to a small firm, then come back. You know, you might just, learn something. Just to try it out? Just to try it out? Just to try it out? Sure, maybe. And, and people can do that. But if everyone's thinking that way, I would say, no, you, you don't have to. You don't have to whatsoever. Not necessary. Yep. Not necessary to, you know, I want to do it to be well-rounded. I, some, some people aren't well-rounded and they're specialists and they're awesome at it. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. Uh, number, let's see here. Number five, what should young architects determine, or sorry, how should young architects determine the value of working at a reputable design firm that doesn't pay well? How do you define value? When you are young and if you can do it, meaning you can live with a roommate, you don't have much expensive, absolutely do it. Um, absolutely. It, I think it was very fun for me. It gives you that name, brand recognition and all that. Um, if you can't, like Lance worked at a really good firm, but it, like if you said their name, it's not like Liebskin where you know it. Yeah. We're sitting at the same place at the same table. Right. Literally. Right. Yep. Right across from <laughs> this guy. How do you define value? How do I define that? Yep. So like, how about this? I'll, just, I'll, I'll paint this. I'll kind of do it in a different way. Yeah. How do you define value? When we're hiring somebody, how do we define value when we're hiring somebody? So what do we, how, what determines what we're going to pay this person? Right. How does it work? So the first is we have to look at their portfolio and see that they have some design skills. If you don't have design skills and we know that schools heavily cater towards design, you don't have the ability to do good designs then. So man, if you know, we know that you were taught that. So get out of here. So one portfolio design skills, presentation skills, and then we need to see the inkling that you can figure out and know how to get the real stuff done. How we see that is maybe in sections, maybe asking you, talking to you, maybe you have some construction experience or experience at another firm, maybe experience at another firm, but it's practical and uh, design are the two things. And then also like, do they fit in your culture and all that too? But yeah. But yeah. you can't control that. Like you, you know, you are who you are, right? Yep. Exactly. So, but the other two you can't control. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, and then it's a, but then it's a risk, right? Like every time we hire somebody, if, if they're, we've never worked for us before. It's, we're taking, we are taking a risk on a bet and saying, okay, they're going to be valuable. They're going to be valuable. So I don't know. There's no, and it, it, it's hard. What's hard to do is hard. I think is hard to get down to brass tacks about like, okay, how do we determine exactly the m- money wise wh- what what somebody is value? You know, what are they valued at salary wise or hourly wise? Right. Yep. Um, and part of it comes from okay. Well, will the mar- well, first of all, what will the market bear? And we've kind of we have our hourly rates, so we know what the market will bear. And then you know, there's the idea that everybody should know this if you're if you're somebody looking for a job or you're going to be or whatever. The, you're supposed to bill out um, two to three times what you're paying somebody. So if you're paying somebody ten bucks an hour, you should be billing out, let's say, the three three times thirty bucks an hour. Um, so there's sort of like this this play that goes back and forth with how it works. But that's how we're looking at people candidates going. The one piece of advice I'd give, I'd give to anybody who's a prospective looking at trying to get their first job or or another job is, do not oversell yourself on those specific software skills. I've seen like a lot of potential candidates come into our office and they'll put like a, they'll say, they'll have these little cute little graphics. Um, Which I love. Yeah. Where they say like Revit skills and they'll have like zero to 10 and they'll put like eight, eight out of 10. Like that's a subjective scale. Yeah. And we've seen, so we've had people come in and they, let's say they put 10 out of 10 out of Revit and then we go, okay, great that you're a great candidate. And then they take the three day course that we that we offer internally, right? Yep. Um, and then they go, yeah, I, I I really didn't know Revit. That was you know, and then maybe it comes in like a six or year month or six month or, or twelve month review later, where we go, hey, looking back at it, you know, where do you think you were at? And they're like, ah, I, yeah, kinda, but you don't know what you don't over, know exactly what you don't know. So just be careful. That's that's yeah. my point. Okay, next next topic: leadership, business acumen, and financial literacy for small firm architects. What changes have you discovered to make in order to make your career goals to meet your new business model? 
Does that make sense? Let me repeat it. What changes have you discovered to make in order for your career goals to meet your new business model? That your career goals and what you want are financed through the amount of work you can bring in. (laughs) So you have to pair your goals, your dreams with a real understanding of value. And that value can be defined as, hey, I do great buildings, I have great service and everything. But it boils down to this one little unit called money. And steady money. I was literally having this discussion with my wife last night. And my advice to her was, you need to get some steady income coming in so that you can fund your ultimate goal. And I go, that's what Alex and I have done from day one is. That's why we're W4 employees, first and foremost, and we have a, we've always maintained a steady flow of income. So when we go to a bank, they're confident. Oh, yeah. These guys for literally now nine years yep. have proven here's how much they're getting paid every month. Same thing with the, when, with the work we do at CU Boulder. Great. And that's a steady source of income. Banks need that reassurance. Yep. They need to not. They, it goes back to your Richard Branson quote. Yep. So if you want to do crazy cool architecture, you absolutely can. But know that, okay, how do I get that? I can't charge nothing for it and I can't charge too much for it if I don't know how I actually make it happen. Yep. Number two, how do you define the difference between management and leadership? Well, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I think they're totally different. Um because I think management is just making sure what needs to get done gets done. Yep. Yep. I think leadership is setting the example, meaning um showing them that Showing everyone that you take responsibility, that you're taking ownership, that you take pride in it, that you have a passion in it, that this is, you know, the right thing to do. Um, and all of those lead to inspiration. Yep. So instead of inspiration in, in just some sort of quote, it comes from actual examples of what you do. And I think leaders take the heat and management makes the meat. Does that make sense? Look at that. I know. Uh, number three, inform staff. Informed staff make better decisions. Do you discuss firm-wide objectives and pro- project-specific finances and profitability with your staff? You do, Al. Yep. So every Monday besides this Monday, for whatever reason, I have a meeting with the guys. We track where we're at, what's going on. Um, all of our contracts that have how much money uh, that are in those contracts are in the specific folder that they can look at and highlight where they're at we at don't all hide times. It. So, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. I, so I, I've been doing the same thing. I actually followed Alex's lead here. Uh, so he led, and then I said, and so I've been, so I've been trying to do that too, is every Monday morning, and actually almost every morning now, I, I try to you know go over to everybody's desk and say, hey, where are we at? Pull up your list. Our guys have been really great about, at least on my side, have been with a nice little list. They just keep a Word document going, tasks, they highlight stuff, and we just go methodically through everything, and then we, I restate, like, what are the goals? And, and we so like a, meetings are so critical um, mm-hmm. one on one, but we what we don't do and I I don't I don't know if we ever want to go there I, I personally don't I I think we tried it a long time ago it was like a Monday morning meeting where we all sit around at the table I think one on ones are so much more effective you yeah. know than a staff wide one so it's one on one number four as an incentive towards efficiency growth do you offer slash will you plan to offer a profit sharing plan for qualified staff um absolutely. Absolutely. I think after this development is done, um, it's, it's just going to naturally come in place with the architecture firm and then future developments will have that as its, as its core. Yep. But the key for us in order to do that is we're going to have to, and it will happen after the development is we're going to have to start bringing, bringing, um, season, the people who are seasoned veterans here at F9 on sales meetings so that they understand Here's how you do a sales meeting. Here's how it works. Here's the follow-up. And I think that's a whole other year, at least, of training people. And, and then them showing that they can bring in money and, okay, now you're, maybe here's the junior partner level type of stuff. Plus yeah. licensure. I think that's necessary. you need to be a licensed architect. Yeah. Yep. Uh, number five, what is the biggest challenge in architecture today? And what are you going to do to solve it? Ooh, that's a great question. I wasn't not prepared for these questions. Good. I saw that they came in, but I didn't look Um the biggest challenge is to not 3D print. Be, what? 3D print. Yeah. And it goes to not be irrelevant. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I think 3D printing probably will drastically change uh, how, how things are done. And I think 
that architects need to get closer and closer to reality, how things are built, and the actual money of it, or else, what are you doing? Got to do it. What are you? Because there's software that's coming out that will do code analysis check. I know on what you're doing. So think about this: if it can, there's also a different software that can lay out rooms, parking, and all that. If you couple those together, where it can lay out rooms, parking, and the one that can do code analysis, what are you doing? Unless you know what what are you doing? And then and then you couple doing? that with a third one that can design it, you know, do design options. Mm, it's tricky. It's going to get tricky out there. It is going to get tricky out there. Yeah, I agree. Uh, okay, N- last topic: real estate development and the value of architects as developers. When did you first realize you wanted to become a developer? What are the drivers? We probably realized in what 2013, 14, somewhere around there. Uh, maybe a little bit sooner, but yeah, sure. 2012. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we realized then, what was the second part of the question? What are the drivers? What are the drivers? I, I think it's one, be a customer of your own product. And then two, get more responsibility. So you actually know what you're doing. And then thus in the end result, get more reward. Yep. Yep. Money equals freedom. Um, how <laughs> it does. How does your firm organize itself? to approach projects from the dual role of architect and developer. So if it's architect and developer, we're doing it all ourselves. We don't approach anyone else. We just take charge and do it. Number three, how do you look, or sorry, what do you look for in a potential development project? Return on investment. (laughs) Yeah, ROI. And then also within the typology that we understand. Yes, and I think the other, one very specific thing was, uh, what is that percentage you threw out originally when we were looking at that piece of land? 18%. Of, there you go. And what is that 18%? Can you define it for us? <laughs> when you look at your total project costs, the land plus, you know, like whatever road you need to put into it or whatever to get it so that you can build a building should be 18% or less. Of the total budget, right? Yep. Yep. Ours was less. And so it was a layup. Yep. yep. Uh, okay. Last one. What portion of your current work is developer driven versus client based ideally what would you like the ratio to be in the future so well since (laughs) this project hasn't technically broke ground you know you could technically say it's zero percent no no i think what he's asking is like let's say a developer comes to you versus a client oh oh oh. yeah um i would say i'm 75 percent developer once you that Yeah. yeah I don't know about And you. about the same, I would say. Yeah. And maybe that's not actually the question. Maybe it is the other way he asked. Or you were thinking it was too. So, yeah. right. So, so, if it is the other way where Alex was thinking zero because we're still having our building. Yep. We're frustrated. Yep. But I would like to be 50% projects developer develop that we do and 50% with the developers that we like and trust. Yeah. I even consider clients developers. Even if you're building a single family home, you're developing it. So, yep. you're developing a project. Okay. All right. Uh, so, Henry, thanks for all the questions. And I think with that, we have Nick Reeds. Hello, best friends. I hope you all had a great week this week. A reading. Work within things. It is said that one of the most impressive things about the music of Johann Sebastian Bach is its architecture. Its construction seems clear and transparent. It is possible to pursue the details of the melodic, harmonic, and rhythmical elements without losing the feeling of the composition as a whole, the whole that makes sense of the details. The music seems to be based upon a clear structure, and if we trace the individual threads of musical fabric it is possible to apprehend the rules that govern the structure of the music. Construction is the art of making meaningful whole of many parts. Buildings are witnesses to the human ability to construct concrete things. I believe that the real core of all architectural work lies in the act of construction. 
At the point in time when concrete materials are assembled and erected, the architecture we've been looking for becomes part of the real world. I feel respect for the art of joining, the ability of craftsmen and engineers. I'm impressed by the knowledge of how to make things, which lies at the bottom of human skills. I try to design buildings that are worthy of this knowledge and merit the challenge to this skill. People often say a lot of work went into this when they sense the care and skill that its maker has lavished on a carefully constructed object. The notion that our work is an integral part of what we accomplish takes us to the very limits of our musings about the value of a work of art, a work of architecture. Are the effort and skills we put into them really inherent parts of the things we make? Sometimes, when I'm moved by a work of architecture, in the same way I'm moved by music, literature, or a painting, I'm tempted to think so. Peter Zumpner thinking architecture. A question. Al or Lance? Toodles! <laughs> Great question. Great question. The. Depends. Do you like steak or do you like canned broccoli? <laughs> <laughs> canned broccoli. You should see who I'm pointing to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, BC, you know, people, some people may like canned People broccoli. like canned broccoli. Hey vegetarians vegans what are you gonna do so what i like about this and i think what we were trying to talk about especially with some of the questions about you know what do you do how do you do things it's all about so what nick references the he talked about the music there was the construction behind it was clear so what you're designing is great but that's a product of the system behind the design. So what is your system that you're operating on? If you're really creative, maybe you're grabbing from multiple sources, you're more chaotic, you're more, you know, uh, you're doing different things. If you're doing clear architecture, um, you can still, you know, look at multiple different sources and all that, but know that it's a reflection of you, right? So you could be a shitty architect and you could go to a big firm, a middle firm and a small firm. And then realize that you're still a shitty architect. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So my wife and I went to uh, our, one, our, literally our favorite art museum in the world. And that is um, Clifford. the Clifford Still Museum in Denver last weekend because uh, well, we, we had this other thing to go to. But bigger reason is because it was our favorite, our favorite museum. And my wife has done two replicas of his art in our house. So I've seen how she constructs it. And what's, what was, what's always interesting to me when I go to any art museum, and this is what blows me away about Al Gore, is, is aren't you interested in how that art was constructed? Because I'm constantly asking my wife, when we walk around and look at the art, I'm like, man, this is cool. How did they do it? And she usually knows because she, she's like one class away. I don't know if she'll ever get it for, from a fine arts degree. Mm-hmm. She did. She did. She went, to, she went to CU Denver, actually, to try to go get that, and that's why she's adept at painting. So... You look at buildings, and I know you look at them like I do, and at least one way, and you're like, man, that's cool. How did they build it? Yeah. Art, don't care. <laughs> Wait, no, no, no. So I love the Clifford Steel Museum. I think it's awesome. Yeah. I do obviously enjoy some some art. Right? Some. And the the thing is that I just don't think that they're more important or more <laughs> more important than architects. You know, that they should be valued over like, oh, you know, for, for somehow they're just this, this class that is, is the answer to everything, which I just don't buy. <laughs> Um, could you give me an example of like where you asked, how did they make that art? Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, he's got, uh, what is a good example here? Let me think about this actually. So there's all different, so there's a couple different techniques like in his art that he does. It's either brushed or like with a knife or like a combination. And then there was this one piece that it looked like, I was like, how did he make that line? So perfect. It doesn't look like a. It doesn't look mm-hmm. like a brush mark. It doesn't look like a knife mark. She goes, "Oh, he literally took the tube of paint, 
put the tube of paint up there, smeared it around a little bit, and then and then squeezed the tube of paint to make this like blood red line down. And I was like, oh man, that's cool. Can you do that on the next one? Yeah. So that's one example, right? Like I I don't know. So to me, it's like a mystery, and I'm excited about learning about it, right? Yeah. And but, that, that's a clear design tool. But I don't I don't put art I don't put artists over art architects or architects over artists. I guess I just don't. I just think I've I it's like to me it's like comparing an apple to an orange. Uh, your fruit eh, but I don't really care of that I don't think one is better than the other, you know. Now if we're talking about Skittles, clearly yellow or not Skittles, Starburst, Purple. yellow yellow Starburst are the best. Ooh. <laughs> I do like yellow. Red. Starburst. Skittles, I got to go with purple. Strong purple. purple. No, blue. Blue. But I, I've heard that they've changed tastes and colors, so like I'm, oh, man. I'm just not what getting it, into that. world coming Not to? getting into that. I have enough controversy with <laughs> what I say already. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, well, thank you, Nick. And, and if I had to choose, I would choose Lance. Yeah, I would choose Al. <laughs> okay, let's bring in the boys for ARE Jeopardy. Let's kick it off, boys. According to IBC 705.5 fire resisting rating, at which fire separation distance can walls be rated from the inside only? So, understand the question here. Exterior walls we're talking about. At what fire separation distance, so at what distance, can the walls be rated from the inside only? A, 5 feet. B, 10 feet, C, 15 feet, D, 30 feet. So there's some distance where an, another wall from another building is so far away that you don't have to rate it from inside and outside. You only have to rate it one, you know, one hour probably from inside. What is that distance? How far away does that other building have to be? A, 5 feet, B, 10 feet, C, 15 feet, D, 30 feet. Do, 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 do. What do we got over there? B, A, D, the answer is B. 10 feet? 10 feet. 10 feet. Yep. Yep. So they'll say, you know, hey, if it's within 30 feet, it has to be one hour. But if there isn't a building for 10 feet, that one hour is from the inside only. Instead of both. If there's a building that's seven feet away, both sides. I was going to guess 30. Look at that. So look at me learning something today. Yeah. Can you get a marker so I can tally these we boys can do up? It. Uh, here's a pink one. Pink. All right, question two. Type five construction is that type of construction in which the structural elements, exterior walls, and interior walls are made of A, wood, B, concrete, C, heavy timber, D, any materials permitted in this code. There is a clear answer. Okay, are you ready, boys? We have A, A, and D. D is correct. If you read the actual code, so we all think about it, what because it's the cheapest, right? But you could have a type 5 building that's made of concrete if you want. D- d- doesn't matter, right? And the reason why this is important is because you could have a building where one part is concrete because it's a parking lot, and the part above it is, is wood because it's not a parking lot. It's, it, you know... But it could still be type uh, type 5. There you go. All right. On to the good questions. Lance Psycho prepared. So what do we got for a tally? Who's winning? 1-1 one, one, goose egg. 1-1 one, one, goose egg. Good enough. Number three. What is a large wood screw with a head similar to that of a bolt and without a nut known as? A, wood screw. B, screwy boy. C, leg screw. D, screw. What is a large wood screw with a head similar to that of a bolt and without a nut known as A, wood screw, B, screwy boy, C, leg screw, D, screw? Are you saying leg or lag screw? L-A-G. Lag. Yep, lag. All right, what do we got, gentlemen? Let's see. C, A, C. The correct answer is C and C. Do, 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 so do. two, one, egg, goose egg? Two, two, one, one, two, one, one. Yeah. two one one two one one two one one yep two one one here we go four all right yep. all right we could yep. have a tie or we could have a winner we could yep uh, number four <laughs> what is the method used to provide 
the bolt tension specified for high strength bolts in which the bolts are first brought to a snug condition then tightened additionally by a specified amount of nut rotation is it a specified nut sorry specified s- snug fit method uh, b turn of nut method g tight boy c c <laughs> sorry h specified tension method d and and i will sorry d uh, the the word document is screwed up. Okay, I, I, I'll, I'll repeat the whole thing just for one more clarification because that's a that's a this is a this is a dense one to unpack, gentlemen. Uh, number four, what is the method used to provide the bolt tension specified for high strength bolts in which the bolts are first brought to a snug tight condition and then tightened additionally by a specified amount of nut rotation? A Specified snug fit method. B, turn of nut method. C, tight boy. D, specified tension method. Piece of cake, piece of cake right? Piece of cake. <laughs> what do we got? All right. We got D, A, and A. Uh, neither of those are correct. The correct answer is turn of nut method. Turn of nut. Look at that. So dumb. Mark Pedler so wins. Dumb. Mark Pedler wins. Con- yeah. Two weeks in a row. Congratulations. All right. So if you, if you like the podcast and want more of our voices and want to learn Revit, go to RevitRocketShip.com. Uh, you'll learn Revit from us. You'll get basically you know, our system of how to do it. <laughs> And uh, you, if you don't like it, no worries. Uh, guaranteed, you can get your money back. If you want to read our book, go to Amazon.com. It's a creativity code. You'll like that also. Also, a great gift for all your architect people out there and all your staff. Yeah. Uh, I was r- happily reminded once again by Chad Harris that if you're going to review this podcast, you should you should review it. Maybe, maybe you're going to review it with one star. Put five stars right on top of that. So please go to your iTunes app if you're listening to this and give us a review. It helps us with the rankings. It helps us grow the podcast. It helps us reach more people uh, like Chad Harris to help him out. And also, please do follow up with the uh, with the show notes. Check out The Everyday Architect. That'll be on Amazon November 18th. And uh, buy yourself a copy. Buy all your firm a copy. And have a great week. 